I'm just going to say a few words. Mostly, I just want to welcome a friend, Olivares, who, um, as I think you know, if you looked at the bio, was was a student here not so long ago, 2008, yeah. graduated, um, and was very involved in the Shell Center and the Lowenstein Clinic. So th these occasions, I used to think they were kind of rare occasions and really special for me to have our own students back to talk to us about things they have done. Um, I guess in a, in a really sort of beautiful and fortunate way, it's, it's not as unusual an occurrence as it was in my early years as so many of our students are doing good and interesting work. But this is still really special. I would say a friend was not only our student, but has become a really good friend. Um, and also because it's not just talking about the work that he's been doing, but he's talking about this book that he has written um, which is, is a, I think, in, in many ways an unusual book, um, and we'll talk about that uh, some today. But as I think you know, it's a book that weaves together in some ways the personal as, as well as uh, his personal story of his own immigration and the story of working with immigrants. Um, and so I, I am not going to give your whole bio, which you might normally do in a, an introduction, because to some extent you're going to be talking about that. But I'll, I'll just say that um, after law school, um, a friend was one of our Bernstein Human Rights Fellows working at the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. And then after a bit of a detour at a law firm, for a while it was working on the border um, at the, for the Texas Civil Rights Project and ended up being pulled or pushed into this work uh, by the policies of the U.S. administration, particularly at that time the Trump administration, although it's not like we can point to Democratic administrations and see that policies were uh, more, uh, a lot more humane. Um, but, but 2018 is the year of the focus and the, the policies of particularly of family separation that led to this really um, well, gripping work that, that you did. And so my friend's going to talk to us a little bit about the book, maybe read a, a, a bit from it, and then I might ask a couple of questions to get us started, and then we'll open up and hope we can have you know, a really pretty comfortable conversation uh, without much formality with, with this small and intimate group. So thank you very much for being Thank the library for co-sponsoring this is a little bit different kind of book talk than, than the library all, often does, but um, we're really pleased to be doing this with, with our own law library and uh, several other sponsors, too, whoever. <laughs> so, welcome. Thank you, thank you Jim, and thank you, everyone. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Jim, and thank you to everyone for being here. Thank you to the library for co-sponsoring, for inviting me. I, I do know the list of all the co-sponsors, yeah, so, okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> The, yeah, the Center for Latin American and Iberian Studies, the LALSA, the Macmillan Center, the, the Latin American Series, the Shell Center, the Library, and Yale Immigrant Justice Project. So thank you to all of those groups for having me. It's great to have a small group. We can have more of an intimate conversation, and I hope this is a bit of a different book talk that Jim mentioned, I hope in a good way, than, than is normal. Um, what I was thinking I could do is give a brief overview of the book by sharing some of the stories in the book and some of my own story, and then we can start a conversation and happy to take it in, in any direction. Um, I, as Jim mentioned, I graduated in 08, and I guess the older you get, the, the more you say, it doesn't feel like that long, but it's been, <laughs> it's been more than 14 years, so I guess it's been, it's been a minute. Um, in Welcome. In, in 2018, I was in, in McAllen, Texas, about six miles from the border, working at the Texas Civil Rights Project. And I received a phone call from a federal public defender in McAllen who had been working there for many years. And she was reaching out because her clients, who were immigrants, she represented immigrants who were charged with the misdemeanor of crossing the border between ports of entry. It's a law that has been in the books in its current form since the 50s and in prior forms since 1929. 
And historically, prosecutors had discretion who to charge, like for every most other crimes. Um, but now they were charging everybody. And people who had been traveling with a son or a daughter had been separated from them. And then they were coming to the defenders, to the public defenders, saying that when they crossed a day or two prior, their children were taken from them, and they didn't know anything about them. When they would see them again, where they were, who was caring for them. So she's telling me this on the phone, and my first reaction was one of incredulity. I, it just can't be. It, it can't be that in 2018 in this country we're going to be taking children away from their parents without any process, let alone due process, without any documentation. I just couldn't believe it. I asked her if she could write an, an affidavit for us, still not knowing what we would do with it, what kind of lawsuit, TRO, or injunction we would seek. but having some factual evidence to back that up. And she said she couldn't because these were her clients. So it would be breaching the attorney-client privilege. But she said then we interview them right before their criminal hearings. They start at 9 o'clock, and they start bringing them in at 7, 7.30. So if you can be here at 7.30, you can talk to them directly. So the very next day, I was the only lawyer in, the, in that office of TCRP, and a paralegal. It was, it was the only two employees in that office, so we went into the courtroom the next day. I had been in that building before. It's uh, the one of two high-rises in McAllen, Texas, where the federal court uh, sits, and this was in one of the magistrate courtrooms. And it was unlike I had ever seen it before. Packed with people, all the benches that are typically reserved for the public to observe the proceedings, were filled with men and women of all ages, shackled, handcuffed, looking tired and sleep deprived, wearing dirty and smelly clothes that they had been wearing probably too long, the interpreters trying to set up the equipment, public defender, the judge wasn't there yet, but every, it's just chaos in the courtroom. And the public defenders and investigators are meeting with each of them one by one to tell them about the charges they are facing. You're being charged with this misdemeanor, maximum sentence is six months in prison, but if you plead guilty, you get time served. So you're out of here right away. And they have this conversation first with them as a group, and then when they start interviewing them one by one, we asked how many of you were traveling with a child and were separated from your child. And that morning, five people tried to raise their hand because they were handcuffed, so they stood to try to indicate. It was three dads and two moms. Four of them were traveling with one child, and one of the moms had three children. And they had crossed, it was on a Thursday, they had crossed the day before or on Tuesday, and they hadn't seen their children since. So Georgina and I, we started interviewing them in the corner by the witness stand, explaining to them that we weren't their immigration lawyers, we weren't their criminal defense lawyers, we were there only to ask them about the separation. And if they gave us the children's name, date of birth, country of origin, with that information, we could try to locate the children in, with ICE or wherever they were. At that point, we didn't know where they were. And try to arrange for a phone call and try to eventually relocate them, uh, reunite them. Uh, we started doing this every single day. The, they were prosecuting so many people with, uh, for illegal entry that they were doing two shifts a day, 9 a.m. and 2 p.m. And th we lucked out that first morning that it was only five. Most shifts, it was 12, 15, 20. One morning, it was 35. And by the time the hearing started, if you didn't talk to all of them, you have to be out. The, the judge comes in, and you're out. So f most days, we didn't have any time to ask them any details about the separation. Just name, date of birth, country of origin of the parent and of the child. Gradually, we realized that, at least in McAllen and, and Rhea everywhere, that was the only documentation of the separation. The government was not keeping records of which child was traveling with which parent. There was no plan to reunite, so there was no need to document. The, the legal fiction that the administration was relying on to, to make the separations happen, when, when the immigrants or asylum seekers cross the border and seek out a border patrol agent to turn themselves in, the agent takes them into the station to process them, 
they are in the custody of Border Patrol, which is part of DHS. When they're transferred, when the parents are transferred over to court to be prosecuted, the U.S. Marshals take them. That's DOJ, the Department of Justice. At that point, the child is in DHS custody and the parent is in DOJ custody. The child becomes unaccompanied without a parent in DHS custody and then unaccompanied children are under the jurisdiction of the Office of Refugee Resettlement, which is under HHS, Health and Human Services. So by mandating the prosecutions of everybody, they created this fiction that generated the legal separation, and that's how they were doing them. The parents, when they came to court, didn't know any of this, right? So when I asked them, some of them had been separated that morning, and when I would ask, uh, did anybody tell you when you might see your son or daughter again? They were under the impression that it would be that same afternoon. Yeah, this afternoon when I go back to, to the station. And as the days passed, we knew that wasn't the case, right? That we knew that the children were being sent to, to a shelter. And now, in retrospect, it's easy, but try to put yourself back in that position in 2018 when we had no idea how long the policy was going to be in place for. We didn't know if they were ever going to be reunited. Our greatest fear at the time was that the parents would be deported without their children. And then what? The, the challenge of trying to locate the parents in Central America or Mexico or wherever they were. Um, so when they were telling me that I'm going to see him this afternoon, I knew that that was not likely the case, but I didn't want to tell the parent that. I didn't have the words to break it to them. I also didn't want to lie to them. And, and this is in the middle of that chaos in the, in the courtroom. So I would tell them, well, I hope he's there, but there's a chance he's not there. Okay, so then, then where is he going to be? Well, in, probably in a shelter with other children. And still no big reaction from the parent. Okay, so then if not this afternoon, when am I going to see him again? And that was the question that I just couldn't bring myself to answer truthfully or to lie about it. So I, you know, wobbled in between. It's like, well, we're trying our best to make sure that we can locate them in the shelter and then arrange for a phone call between you and, and your son. And that's when they would break down crying. In a span of about a month, we interviewed nearly 400 parents in McAllen alone. And there are 19 courthouses along the border where these prosecutions were happening. And we heard terrible stories from the parents. We started getting their consent to share their stories with the media as, in order to do advocacy anonymously. And some gave their consent and others didn't. Um, a mom with a six-year-old with special needs who was separated from them. Um, a mom who was breastfeeding her child when the child was taken from her. Just some horrible, horrible things. And sadly, with, as the weeks and months passed, it became easier to hear all of these atrocities. I found myself losing sensitivity to the, to the shock of what these parents were going through and having to break to them in the middle of the chaotic courtroom that we did not know when they were going to see their children again or if they were going to see them again. But what never crossed my mind that entire summer was that, but for a couple of decades, I might have been one of those children. I was, I was born in Mexico, in northern Mexico, and for the first nine years of my life, everything in my life was in Mexico. I was expecting to live in Mexico. My mom's side of the family was all in Mexico, and my dad's side, uh, I had some aunts and uncles who had moved to the U.S., but there were no plans for us to move. And then when I was nine, in fourth grade, my father moved to the U.S. in search of work. He had been a bus driver in Mexico, so he found a job as a school bus driver. And for the next four years, he was in Texas, and we were in Mexico, my, my mom, my siblings, and I. And we would see him occasionally, a week in a month or so, when he was able to visit us. He, he was a U.S. citizen, and we didn't have the paperwork to come to the U.S., so we couldn't visit. And at the time... It didn't feel particularly hard to me. I don't remember agonizing over not seeing my dad for weeks at a time. I guess at that age, 
it is what it is. It's kind of the hand that life deals you. And I didn't think much of it. My friend's parents would go to work and come back in the evening. And my dad went to work, and he came back three weeks later. But with, with time, and when I had my own children, I started reflecting about what that meant for me and my identity as, as an immigrant in this country and what I ended up dedicating my career to or what I have to so far. Um, and particularly what it must have been for my mother to raise, particularly my younger brother and I. I have three older siblings, but they were, they were grown at the time. So for those four years, my mom was largely a single mom, you know, trying to raise my brother and me, trying to make ends meet in between visits from my father, taking care of medical emergencies, and everything that a, that a single parent has to do, even though technically <laughs> I had both of my parents. Um, and I, you know, we hear a lot about the sacrifices of people who, who move to the U.S. in search of safety or opportunity, the journeys to get here, whether it is, you know, by, by land or by sea. And, but we don't often hear about the sacrifices of those who stay behind. And I had never thought about that, frankly, until I started writing the book and, and thinking about those sacrifices. And the, the experience I lived was, of course, I, not comparable to that of my clients, but the lived experience of having to leave everything behind, pick up and go, and move to a different country where you don't speak the language, where you're not familiar with the culture, and start over, that did, I think, gave me the cultural competency to then advocate on behalf of the separated families in, in 2018. And in, in writing the book, so the book is, braids those two stories. The chapters go back and forth between the 2018 um, work at the Texas Civil Rights Project and my own experience growing up once, once my father had left. And the other piece of the book is, in 2018, it was very common to hear people opposed to the policy to say, this is not who we are as a country. These are not American values. This is not who we are. So I started looking into that, into the history of immigration policy in this country and how have immigrant children, immigrant families been treated in the past to see what the historical record shows. And for the first, well, the first reference to immigration is the Naturalization Act of 1790, so very early on. And it limits naturalization to free white persons. So right off the bat, citizenship is tied to race. As far as immigration laws, there was no federal immigration laws at all for the better part of the 19th century. Anyone could come to the US whenever, however, there were no restrictions whatsoever. The first federal restriction was in 1875, the Page Act, which limited um, the admit, prohibited, in fact, the admission of people from East Asia, of persons coming uh, to engage in forced labor, and women who, uh, the law limited who, women who came to engage in prostitution. What that meant is that it prohibited effectively the arrival of all women from East Asia. In 1882, you have the Chinese Exclusion Act a few years later, which is to this day the only law that explicitly names a nationality and ethnicity for exclusion in its title. And in the years after that, the rejection of immigrants based on, on race and nationality was blatant and explicit. In the early years of the 20th century, with the arrival of Irish immigrants and Italian immigrants and Jewish refugees, many of whom, most of whom, were not considered white at the time, and we could talk at length about the social construct that is race and how what is white and who is white has changed over the years. But what that did and, and the, uh, generated a backlash that led to the passage in 1924 of the National Origins Act which was a comprehensive immigration law that limited the number of people who could come to the U.S. by country. It set quotas and a cap, and it reserved over 85% of those quotas to northern European countries, predominantly white countries. And the legislative history around that law and around those years is filled with racist motivations. President Wilson saying that we cannot have 
races come into the U.S. that do not mix well with the Caucasian race explicitly. That was the reason to limit who could come and from where. And that same year, in 1924, is when the Border Patrol is established to enforce those very laws at the, at the southern border. And during World War II, Japanese Americans and Japanese immigrants sent to internment camps without any regard to family unity. It was very common for the parents being sent to one camp and the children to another. And I share those examples not to chastise American history, but I think it's also important not to romanticize it or sanitize it. I think it's important to see what the facts are when it comes to immigration policy so that we can understand that the current laws are coming from that. The immigration agencies and immigration laws have their origin and are des were designed to exclude certain immigrants and admit others based on this vision of, of a group, perhaps not of everybody, but that group managed to get their views into legislation of, of this country being reserved exclusively for white people. And that was sanitized in the laws for a long time, and then in recent years it became much more explicit again. You hear about the great replacement theory in mainstream media today as if it's um, with, unapologetically. So the book also touches on that, uh, examples throughout history, the origins of, of ICE, of the Border Patrol, and the racial disparities. I also want to be clear, and I'll close with that and we'll go to question, that the, in the best case, racial disparities are not something of 100 years ago. I'm sure you all have seen the news and reports about the buses of migrants from Texas to multiple cities and the flights that the state of Florida chartered from Texas to Massachusetts. Think about who's been on those buses and those flights. It's been predominantly Venezuelan asylum seekers and migrants, Colombian, Haitian. But what I bet you haven't seen is buses or flights of Ukrainian asylum seekers. For them, we somehow managed to find the staff and the resources to process thousands of them. And I'm glad we did that because they need that. They need the protection. They're fleeing horrendous things in their country. But so do the Haitian asylum seekers. And how have we received them on horseback at the Texas-Mexico border and with a whip? So the racial, and, and that's with this administration. The racist application of our immigration laws continues to be something very present today. And um, I hope my book speaks to that as well. And yeah, that's a quick overview of the book. I probably spoke for, for too long, but we can turn to questions. We can do it in the questions, I think, okay. yeah. Well, so if I, want, I want to start by asking a, a question, a couple of related questions about writing the book, um, not just about what's in the book. And so I just wonder if you could say a little bit about how you first got the idea of writing a book, what, what really motivated you to do it, um, how you decided to do the weaving together of these personal stories from your childhood and growing up. Um, and also tell us, uh, you've told me the story, but the story of how you titled the book. Yeah, so the idea for the book first came up in 2019, I was at the University of Pennsylvania giving a talk to first-generation college students. Um, and in, in talking about that work with, with immigrant families to that group, I included reflections of my own experience as a first-generation immigrant and first-generation college student, first-generation lawyer. And that was the very first time that I thought of those four years without my father as a type of separation. I was like, oh, I, get, I never thought of it in those terms. And by then it had been, yeah, 20, no, not 20, 15 years. And not 20 years, it had been 20 years already. And I, that's when the idea first popped into my head that even th there might be enough of a through line to write a book about it. My initial idea was to do a chapter in Spanish and a chapter in English kind of how my life was at the time, and then eventually merge them. Um, 
somebody's like, that's not, no, no one's going to read that. <laughs> Just write it in English, forget about it. Um, and interestingly, the first proposal was in that format, and then the feedback I got was that doesn't work. Let's do it in chronological order. So move the outline around, and once uh, the editor who ended up getting the book, she said she loved it, but what about we do it braided? So it was vindicating for me that, that, she, that she liked the, my original format. So that's how we brought it back. Um, the title for the book, I, I would love to read an excerpt. It's a short excerpt um, that speaks to the title. Um, this is from the very first day in court when uh, we were in, in the courtroom interviewing the separated parents. Georgina was interviewing one of the moms, and I was interviewing somebody else. So that's where this exchange happens. I was speaking to Lionel, who was also from Guatemala. He was less than a year younger than me and wore a plaid short sleeve shirt, white with dark and light blue lines and cowboy style buttons, the kind you snap together. He must have been no taller than five feet, seven inches. In broken Spanish, he explained that he had come with his 11 year old son, Daniel. Like Viviana and Sandro, another family, they were traveling alone and they were inseparable. He and Daniel were both first time crossers and had no family in the United States. They were hoping to apply for asylum due to the persecution they had faced in their indigenous village. I got all the critical information from Lionel, but I still couldn't believe that the agents had not given him any information about his son, where he was being taken, or who would care for him. Surely the agents must have told him something about the process and about what to expect, I thought. What do you think would happen, I asked Lionel, if you are deported and your son doesn't go with you, if he stays here? He looked down as if thinking about it. And when he looked up, he shook his head. His look was one of resignation. No, pues, mi niño se muere de tristeza. My boy will die of sorrow. For a second, my eyes didn't leave his. I struggled to write down what he was telling me. I pursed my lips and looked down, swallowed hard, and couldn't find words to respond. And it's really meaningful to me that the title of the book is not even my voice, but the voice of one of the of the impacted parents. Yeah, in some ways that, that takes me to something else that interests me and, and, and kind of has interested me in a very general way about the nature of, of human rights work. But you talk about it again in a, in a sort of doubly personal way and that, that's the, the role of empathy and compassion. And you know, you talk about a story like that in your own compassion, uh, but also about the lack of compassion in officials, the U.S. policy, a cruel policy. So I, I wanted to ask you, you know, in a sense, what have you come to understand about empathy and compassion? And I guess I mean that in a few different ways. One thing, I'm always curious, hoping I fight about this actually, um, how do the two differ in meaning to you, if they do? Um, and um, why do we find ourselves able to empathize in some circumstances for some people and not others? And, and in a sense, like, how, how do they work? And I, I put work in kind of quote marks because it, that kind of assumes a utilitarian idea of empathy and compassion. You know, we have them in order to accomplish something. And there's something in some ways fundamentally wrong with that idea, but, but all those kind of together, how, how do they work, how do they differ, how do we end up, like you talked about, we, we seem to have official compassion for the Ukrainians, um, but we don't have it for the Haitians. Um, and race is one answer, but I, th I wonder if you've learned other things about when it, when it takes hold of us and when it doesn't. I think they are different to me, but I would like to think more about it before. <laughs> um, 
in, in many ways, I, I, I guess I was glad that I didn't come to see what I had lived through as a teenager, as a child, as a separation that summer. Because if I had seen that connection in my own, in my own life, I don't know how I would have handled that summer. In the early weeks of, of well, one thing I didn't cover in, in the remarks, but that is in the book, is what we did with that affidavit that we got then from the parents themselves directly, is, is we filed a, a human rights uh, emergency request with the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. Uh, it's called a request for precautionary measures. That's supposed to be an emergency thing. It took still a couple months to, to obtain a favorable ruling. There was a class action in California that was already pending, Ms. L versus I, is filed by the ACLU and others. We were writing op-eds. We were in the news as often as we could every night, sharing the stories of the parents, doing everything we could to try to create pressure to stop this policy. And, and nothing was, was working. We were waiting for a ruling. The class action, the motions in the class action were still pending. And there were still a lot of people who were defending the policy and justifying it, saying it was the parents' fault. They brought their children illegally. It's their fault that the separation happened. And we weren't, we weren't breaking through. I remember having conversations with colleagues that, you know, one of these agents got to have a conscience, and they're going to leak a photo or a video from, uh, on their cell phone, even if it means risking their job from inside the detention centers. And once people see the conditions that the children are in, that will do it. We, we did a fast to protest the separations, and nothing was working, nothing was working. And ultimately, the only thing that leaked was an audio recording. You all might remember hearing it or reading about it. It's an eight minute long audio that ProPublica and another local outlet in South Texas uh, released of children crying inside one of the detention centers. It's extremely painful to listen to. And for those eight minutes, you hear mostly little girls just begging for mommy and papi nonstop. And that audio leaked on a Monday night. And by Wednesday afternoon, less than 48 hours later, the president signed an executive order purporting to end the separations. Now, it's a more complicated story. The, they didn't fully end. But th they certainly ended at that volume that they were happening before. And that audio was so powerful, it turned public opinion against the policy. People who had been justifying it before, this was too much. Hearing what it sounded like, what the policy sounded like on children, took people over a line that the, I guess they didn't know that had been crossed long ago. And I'm convinced that the reason that audio was so powerful and so effective in a way that a video or a photograph wouldn't have been, is because when you hear those children cry, you don't see the color of their skin. And it makes it so much harder to other them. You think of your own children, or yourself when you were a child. And that, I'm convinced, allowed people to feel that empathy and compassion by seeing the children as their own, or thinking of them as their own, without all the other arbitrary things that we give so much significance to. And that's the other thing. Race is one thing, but place of birth, language, skin color, um, immigration status. And that has really gotten me thinking, what else is there? What other arbitrary traits, or not arbitrary traits, are out there that we give so much significance to, to the point that they prevent us from feeling empathy and compassion for fellow human beings? Criminal history, other things. What else are, I, I'm sure there are other things that I haven't realized that for me, that prevent me from feeling empathy and compassion for a fellow human beings that make me judge them because I've been socialized or accultured to give a lot of importance to certain things that make me see uh, another human being as different than me perhaps. So that is one, to me that was the connection once people saw the immigrant families, especially the children, as their own, that was the defining point. And I think the challenge then for me becomes to see, to get the decision makers, the policy makers, 
to see themselves as equal to those who the policies impact. Because if, and whether you're talking about dreamers or asylum seekers or Title 42, people in remain in Mexico, if you don't think of them as your own or as yourself, as the same as you, it's much easier to inflict pain, suffering, discrimination, you name it, on them. So the challenge for me becomes how to find those points of connection that will allow the decision makers, the policy makers, to view those that their policies impact as equal to them or their children. The, the other challenge is for me, and this one I, I, I'll just state it, I don't know what to make of it, is, is the distinction between children and adults. Parents had been crying for weeks and weeks and weeks, but those tears were not as effective as the children. I was on a panel this past weekend uh, with another author, and he was saying that this country is obsessed with helping children, but only children. Perhaps it's this idea that, that children need special protection, that they are defenseless or powerless to defend themselves, or perhaps haven't done anything to judge them by, including crossing a border. Um, and it happens often when, when talking about DACA and DREAMers. I'm sure you've heard this, is, you know, they came here through no fault of their own. But that's implying that the parents had some fault. Talk to a, a DREAMer or a DACA recipient to see if they think their parents were at fault by bringing them. And, and this, these dichotomies or these divisions between the good immigrant and the bad immigrant, all of these things are, in my opinion, artificial barriers that create impediments to get to that empathy and that compassion. Well, yes. We'll open it up. Um, and you, you've touched on this a little bit, but I wonder if you could say a bit more. Um, and that's really about your own um, experience uh, of dealing with these, these things, m meeting these parents, hearing them say these things. And so I wonder how, how you, as a lawyer, as an immigrant yourself, as a father, um, how you have dealt with the emotional cost of doing this work um, at the moment and, and, and now in writing the book? Um, uh, how, how, did, how did the writing affect you? Um, yeah, how, how have you, and have you learned lessons about how to be able to keep at this work uh, despite those emotional costs? Yeah, I, I have two children and in 2018 had one. He was almost a year and a half at the time. Um, and that summer, he was starting you know, daycare. And when I was in court, my wife, Carla, took him to daycare for the first time. And I imagine not everyone here has children, but the experience of taking your kids to preschool or school or daycare for the first time is not a pleasant one, as you can imagine. So the daycare called my wife in less than an hour after she had dropped him off, saying that could she come and pick him up because he wouldn't stop crying. He couldn't be without her. And that's common. It happens to most children. And we had the luxury, the blessing, the privilege of being able to go and pick him up. And that earlier that morning, I had been hearing from the parents that they didn't know where their children were or when they might see them again. And I never interviewed any of the children. I don't know what they were thinking. That contrast of having my own child, my own son, and being able to hug him every night, putting him, put him in bed, and contrast that with the experiences of, of the families was extremely painful at the time. And I, you know, that summer was unhealthy, I'm sure. It was adrenaline and, and too much coffee that kept us going with this feeling that we had to do it. Probably some saviorism too, by the way. We need to document this uh, because no one else is documenting. If we don't do it, no one's gonna know that this was a family traveling together. Uh, but that was the urgency that kept us going. Um, and I still haven't gone to therapy. My wife keeps insisting, and I know I will eventually. But writing the book helped a lot. It was the first 
time that I shared a lot of those stories. In fact, writing it led me to other reflections about my own experience um, that I had never talked about or frankly thought about with, with uh, significantly. I try to tell myself often that this is it's just a job. It's just a job and like turn it off after a certain hour. But the, these jobs, unlike selling widgets, it's, it's so hard to do that because we believe, I believe, I'll speak for myself, that it's so important. It's really important work. So I can't turn it off on the weekends at night. And that becomes, becomes unhealthy and unsustainable. And it's something that I continue to grapple with. I don't think that I have solved it other than the frequent reminders that it's, it's just a job. As important as it seems to me most days, it's a job, and it's not trying to differentiate my own identity from the work. Because that, if the work becomes my identity, then how can you turn it off? And it's, it's an ongoing, ongoing struggle. One thing that has helped a little is a mindset shift, mindset shift for me about what I'm trying to accomplish in doing this work. Um, I guess when I was in law school, I had hopes of, I don't know, winning big cases or stopping bad policies or doing big things, getting something across the finish line. And that, as a litigator, feels so far out of reach right now that like, can I be doing this work and waiting for that big victory 10, 20, 30 more years? That feels like a very tall order. But just by not thinking of trying to get across the finish line, but trying to just keep pushing the ball forward and making sure it doesn't roll backwards too far so that all of you can come behind me and keep pushing it, maybe you get to push it across the finish line, that makes it more sustainable. That has helped a lot. And another piece of it is, is f that has helped me is finding within this work what aspect of it is what fuels me and what speaks to me. I often get asked, is it better to do like direct representation of immigrants or impact litigation, nationwide, nationwide class actions or what have you? And the, the answer for me is that all of that work is important and we need people doing all of it. Find the one that speaks to you, that you enjoy, that will fuel you and will allow you to do it sustainably over a long time and stick to that one. Neither one of them is more or less important for me. Um, to me, it's more important that people are able to do the type of work that will keep them going for the long haul. I just want to say that I sustain, sustained myself by counting on you to push the ball across the finish line. So now, now you know, it's another, another generation. Um, no, and I really appreciate what you were just saying, Ben. It's something we talk about a lot. I, I think we all... All of us who care about these issues, I think, have a tendency to do things like go to law school and make decisions about what we should do. And that is part of what we probably ought to think about. But I think we sometimes don't encourage students and others to also think about what gives them joy. <clears throat> and if, if the work doesn't also give you joy, you're probably doing the wrong thing. And there's another way to, to pursue the just ends that matter to you, but one that, that um, yeah, is consistent with who you are and what you're, not only what you're good at, but, but what you like doing. They're not always the same thing. I was probably better at math and science, but, you know, that didn't make me happy. So, yeah, thank you for that.